I can't see you back there. Can you hear me all right? Yes, can. Okay, good. So we're here to talk about mushrooms tonight. I don't know why we'd want to do that. Can you think of a reason? Let's suggest something. They're delicious. Well, they are delicious, but. Somebody want to poison you. Some of our poisons. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So if you could see the tens of millions of spores that are released into the air every single year by, by spore-producing mushrooms, and all those spores were in one place, the surface area would be about equal to that of the African continent. Wow. So there are a lot, a lot of spore-producing mushrooms, but spore-producing mushrooms are only a very small part, a very small percentage of all fungi in the world. So why are there so many different kinds of fungi? What do they do and what does it matter? They're everywhere, those spores are everywhere all the time, every day, in this room. I think we just breathe some. <laughs> and some of them, the spores themselves, carry diseases that can kill you. So mushrooms aren't always good guys but they are so important to us, we could not be here without them. So we're gonna talk a little bit, oops, did that get really loud? We're gonna talk a little bit about what they do and why they do it. Let me see if I can figure this out. Did that work? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so humans rely on a lot of services from ecosystems, services, and we get a lot of goods from ecosystems. The functions that produce those services and goods are results of interactions between and among organisms and between organisms and the non-living parts of the ecosystems. Somebody give me an example of a, some, one of the goods that we get from ecosystems. Decomposition. I didn't hear you. Decomposition. That's a service. Tell me one of the goods we get. Apples. <laughs> Timber. So, so let's talk about services then. One of the most critical services we get from ecosystems is a result of fungi. They recycle nutrients in the soil. They're decomposers and that's an equally important function, but really we can't get by without having those, that nutrient recycling service that happens in the soil. Um, boy, this is a cool little gizmo, but I'm not used to using it. Okay, got it, got it, got it. So we know a lot of things about mushrooms, but we don't know everything. Technology is really helping us learn more and more about fungi and how they operate out there in the real world. Tell me, I know you guys heard from someone else about mushrooms last month. Tell me something you learned or tell me something you already know about mushrooms besides some of them are poisonous. <laughs> Just yell out. A lot of them have a symbiotic relationship with plants. Well, what I learned that was interesting is that it reduces the competition. Her, in her experiments, the plants without, when you put multiple plants together and there was no fungi, competition was an issue. But when there was, they were. Okay, that's an interesting thing you just said, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. That's, that's true, but that's not all there is to it, Tom. So what you see above ground is a very small part of the story. A teeny part of the story, a very teeny part of the story happens on the surface of the soil. Somebody else had something? Um, can't they deliver certain nutrients to the roots of other plants? Absolutely. They share. They communicate with them? Yes. Yeah? Uh, there was a, an essay in Nature back about 2011 or so that uh, in what appears to be a competitive forest, 
as various plants undergo stress, they can actually serve to be as an intermediary between plants that are doing well and plants that aren't doing so well. That's a huge part of what mushrooms do, fungi do. It's, it's the more we understand, the more amazing mushrooms are, really. Um, and, and one of the beautiful things about it is they are so adaptable. So the mushroom plant, if you want to call it that entire, is called mycelium. And as it grows, it grows out these fine thread-like, hair-like growths called hyphae. Um, they, they tend to grow in a more or less circular manner out from the center out. Um, one of my favorite questions always is, what is the largest single living organism in the world? Oyster mushroom. <laughs> it's not an oyster mushroom, but, but, it, but it is up in the Northwest. There are some incredibly huge mushroom growths that are all one organism. Um, the one in Washington state is like 2,200 acres. The people studying it estimate that it could be as much as 5,000 years old. <laughs> um, all those really, really large mushrooms happen to be in the armillaria family. Um, we have an armillaria, a couple of armillarias that grow here locally that grow in little clumps and make little mushrooms that I like to chop off and put in my spaghetti sauce. But um, the really large organisms in the world are in that family, armillaria. So as far as poisoning goes, why would mushrooms poison us? Well, here's the interesting thing about it. Item number one on the things we know about them is we found them in the fossil records from 400 million years ago. That was long before we were around, so why would they have developed ways to kill us? Do they know they were poisonous? Do the mushrooms know they were poisonous? We know they were 400 million years old. We don't, but we know that there are ancient, especially psychoactive mushrooms. And here's what's interesting. We have receptors in our brains and bodies that the molecules from some of these poisonous and psychoactive mushrooms fit precisely. It's as though we were intended in some way to use those mushrooms. We still don't know how or why, but there's a lot, a lot of research going into, especially some of the psychoactive mushrooms being used medicinally in microdoses, yes? some of the poisoning kind of you're going to have to speak up. I'm sorry. Is, it, is some of it kind of incidental because of how closely related we are to fungi than say plants? We are very, animals in general are much more closely related to fungi than plants. So some of it could be that. I mean, we're still trying to figure this out, why it is we have these receptors that fit those molecules. But that could be a part of it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, they're so adaptable that as they begin to grow their hyphae, back to where I started this, as they begin to grow their hyphae through the soil, if they encounter something new that needs to be decomposed, they just retool their chemical makeup. They change their enzymes to match whatever they're trying to break down. So they can decompose almost anything. I mean, what is it in wood that makes it so hard? What, what, is this, what is this cellulose wrapped around? I heard it. Lignin. And what's just about the only thing that can break down lignin? Fungi, yes. So in a forest system especially, if it weren't for fungi, the entire forest system could crash because there would be so much dead material on the ground, nothing new could grow. So fungi start that initial decomposition process when lignin is involved. They're just about the only thing that can. I like to ask the fifth graders that I work with, what, what are those three main decomposers?
So the easy way to remember those three main decomposers, just remember when something dies, the FBI is on the scene. Yeah. Fungi, bacteria, invertebrates, FBI. Nice. So yes, fungi are super important as decomposers. That's one of their functions. The decomposing fungi are saprophytes. So they make their living eating dead stuff. Um, they also can be predatory. Anybody have a clue about that? Okay, so there are some fungi that grow out their hyphae in little loops. And the nematodes, those microscopic or almost microscopic little worm looking creatures that swim through the soil, they come and they swim into this loop of this hyphal growth and the fungus sends all its moisture there so that it swells up and strangles the nematode, kills it, and then grows its hyphae into its dead little carcass and, it, and breaks down, uses enzymes to break down this body to extract and absorb the nutrients, goes to the nearest tree, said some of them are uh, symbiotic relationships with trees and plants, goes to the tree and says, hey, tree, I've got some nitrogen, you want it? And the tree says, yeah, man, send it on over. <laughs> By the way, I've got some excess starches and sugars, you want it? Well, what do fungi love to eat? <coughs> Carbs, <Yeah>. starches, sugars. <laughs> so there are green things that photosynthesize we call them autotrophs. They feed themselves. But do they make everything they need? No. So what the fungus does is it makes nutrients in the soil, especially things like nitrogen and phosphorus, bioavailable for the trees. We're going to talk just a little bit more in a second. But as the, the fungus feeds the tree, its payback is the excess starches and sugars. I mean, everything that takes in food, whether it makes it itself or whether it eats it and digests it, everything that takes in food has to give off waste. And one of the ways trees do that is it exudes its waste through the roots into the soil. And since that photosynthesis process makes starches and sugars, that's what they have the most excess of. So they're exuding the, the carbs that the fungus wants, and the fungus is helping them get nitrogen and phosphorus that the tree wants. Um, about a decade ago, the, the, some of the forest scientists were very concerned because there are some tiny soil insects that you may be familiar, familiar with. They're called springtails because they're this tiny little thing, they have a long tail, they keep it folded up, attached to their abdomen by a device called a glue peg. And if they get startled or there's a predator near, they release their tail and it pushes them out, that springs them into the air so they move away from the danger. They love to eat fungi, soil fungi they love to eat. So the forest people were worried is it possible that springtails could eat enough fungi to cause some negative impact on the forest? So they set up this ex experiment. They introduced the, the fungi into the soil. They planted some white pine seedlings. When everything got together and the plants and the fungi were interacting, they introduced springtails. Well, the springtails went straight to the fungi and started eating them. They used several different kinds of fungi to see what the result was. And what happened was every time the springtails ate a kind of fungus called lacaria, they all died. They repeat the experiment, and every time they eat lacaria, they die. Turns out, lacaria exudes some kind of pheromone, hormone that says to springtails, hey, lunch is over here. And when they come and start to eat it, it kills them. And then they grow their hyphae into their little dead carcasses and <laughs> use their enzymes and break down the bodies, extract the nitrogen. Hey, tree, got some more nitrogen. You want it? 
when they measure, what, you guys will probably know this better than I do. I don't understand everything I know about how they do some sort of marking of the DNA so that if the nitrogen comes from the springtail, they can find it in the pine tree and know that's where it came from. After two months, 25% of the nitrogen in the pine trees came directly from the bodies of the springtails. I mean, that's huge. 25% of their nitrogen intake came right from those springtails that the fungus killed to get it. A few years more recently, they repeated it with gypsy moth larva, a grass, uh, and some other plant. Did the same experiment again with this other thing, uh, this larva, and the exact same thing happened again. So there are fungi that are predatory. They, they don't wait around for nitrogen to be available for them to <coughs> shuttle off to the trees. I think it's remarkable. Um, here's an example of one of our good decomposers that it's, it's something that I know if you've ever been out on the nature trail, you've eventually seen um, Ammonita muscaria. The one on the left is Muscaria. This one is its cousin. It's a slightly yellower version. It's hard to tell in this light, but it's a slightly yellower version. It's a different, it's the same species, but a different variety. Uh, they are great decomposers. In Texas, this is most often associated with oak and hickory. Um, it happens most parts of the year, spring through fall. So when you're out there and you see this, thank it for being a decomposer for you. Yeah. No, they're poisonous. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Most, uh, okay, there are a couple of edible ammonitas there are. You know, I don't know, since most of that entire family are not just toxic, but poisonous and kill you, um, I kind of avoid all the ammonitis. I mean, I, just saying. <laughs> this one is an antiloma. The ones in the background are what it normally looks like. It's the standard stem, cap, gills. Uh, the ones in the front have been infected by another fungus. In fact, the fungus that infects this is that armillaria family. Um, this is another not edible mushroom, but in this infected form, there are a lot of people who eat them. I, I don't know. It's, I don't like to take chances, you know. <laughs> I've made it this long. I'd like to make it a little bit longer. <laughs> this one's called scleroderma. It's a family it's that, um, that one of their common names is earth balls. They're cousins of puff balls. If you've ever been out and seen along a log, those tiny little uh, white balls grow, and they usually grow in kind of in a row. The puff balls, if you catch them early enough, while they're still fresh, still young, if you break them open and the inside is pure white and about the consistency of cream cheese, they're edible and they're good, and I've eaten them a few times. Oh, yay. These, however, are not edible. They make you violently ill. So, but they are great decomposers. So, here's some more questions about fungi. Um, so, the thing about it is, we talked about decomposers, the saprophytes, before. But the ones that are what are considered mycorrhizal fungi, the ones that have a relationship with trees, tend to be mostly in two kind of categories. Those that actually grow into the root system and into the plant. So there's a connection even at the cellular level. And those that only grow around the roots. It's pretty amazing the difference. And this goes to what you were saying earlier. So the ones that grow within the plant make everything happen much more quickly. As you can imagine, they don't have to just release uh, nutrients into the soil nearby the roots and wait for the tree roots to absorb them. They are actually inside the plant sharing 
nutrients and sharing those carbs in that symbiotic relationship. So they can protect trees from things like drought and stress, as well as providing the nutrients for them. Um, there's, there are several new studies that show that what happens is the mushroom actually keeps cells from bursting within the plant under stress and under drought by keeping the moisture level at the right stage, at the right place. Um, and they do that, once again, like you mentioned, that, that is a huge network under the soil. And it's not just one mushroom. It's, it's a bunch of different ones, and they're not all just the endomycorrhizal kind that grow within the plant or all just the ecto that grow around the roots. They all work in combination out there in the soil. They all are connected. They connect all the trees and all the plants together. They move around the nutrients and the moisture as needed, so they keep everybody as happy as possible. And so it's, it's huge to help relieve those stressful situations for plants. Um, as I was saying a minute ago, the, is the ones that grow within the plants obviously are gonna have a faster reaction. And, and here's what is that good thing, bad thing about that. Because the nutrient cycling happens so much more quickly, um, you'll, you'll see a forest that um, is mostly dominated by trees that have relationships with those endomycorrhizal fungi, uh, things like maples and elms. The leaf litter is thinner, the soil layer is thinner, but the diversity is huge. It seems to be because these mushrooms are so tied to their uh, specific trees that they have a relationship with, that it kind of leaves everything else wide open for other stuff to grow. And, those, and there are other kinds of mushrooms, there are other kinds of soil microbes, there's all this activity going on in the soil that these particular fungi and trees have their own deal and everybody else has wide open spaces. The bad part of it is that means in those forests, Invasive species are a much, much bigger problem because everybody has an equal chance to grow there. And we all know the problem with invasives is they tend to take advantage. They didn't come here with their natural controls. So if they get a toehold, they're there and it's hard to get rid of them. On the other hand, the endomycorrhizal fungi, are, they're probably operating in the same area but their main tree species that they associate with are things like oaks and pecans, some birches. Well, tell me something about oaks and pecans. They're nuts. I can't see you, so if you're raising your hand, it's useless. Just shout out something about nut trees. Hardwood. They're in a family of trees that the bird starts with J, and it, I forget the rest of it. Juglones. Juglones. They have to build up a, a, a threshold amount of food in the trunk before they bear nuts. If, uh... Okay, all those things are true, but we're talking about mushrooms. I know there are species that grow under oaks. Nut trees are the ones that when they exude waste into the soil, they also exude some chemicals that inhibit the growth of other kinds of things around them in general. So these endomycorrhizal fungi that grow around their root system help them be as strong and healthy as possible, and the trees in turn are knocking down the competition. The fungi, a lot of these fungi, 
are antibiotic, antifungal. They help protect trees and plants from pathogenic fungi. Um, they have a lot of other properties that protect whatever their symbiotic partners are. But in the case of these species that prefer the nut trees, the oaks and the pecan family, the walnuts, hickories, pecans, they're pretty territorial. They, it's much, much more difficult for invasive species to get into that forest environment than it is where the maples and elms and ash trees are. So I was thinking earlier when the scout was talking about his project, he showed you a couple of pictures. And I want you to think about and tell me where those invasives were in relation to the forest. They were all along the edges. Why is that? In any fully functioning ecosystem, all the niches are filled. There's not room for anything new. But when you disturb the ecosystem, it opens it up for everybody to come in, doesn't it? And so he showed us invasives along a roadway and along pathways. Those are disturbances. That, that ecosystem was disturbed by what, whoever cut those pathways through there. So it's, it's, a, it's a whole complex situation here that goes on in forests, but fungi make sure that the trees and the vegetation there can survive and thrive. Here's an interesting guy. Anybody know what this is? Uh, yep. So. <laughs> Uh, Indian pipes. Yes, they're Indian pipes. They're Monotropa uniflora. Are they green? No. Do they photosynthesize? No. Well, how do they grow? They're parasites. So there's some discussion whether they're parasites on fungi or whether their relationship with the fungi that feed them is symbiotic. There's, there's two schools of thought on that. Nonetheless, if it weren't for a fungal relationship, they wouldn't be here. What is this guy? Lichen. And what are lichens? Algae and fungus. We used to think it was an algae and a fungus. We know better now. Technology is great. I mean, it tells you so much, yes? Uh, is there a cyanobacterium or something? Yes. Some? Yes. And in fact, with newer technology, we know there can be literally hundreds of fungal partners within the lichen. Can be as many as hundreds. Yes, different species. So what these guys do is they take advantage of that ability of fungi to retool their enzymes and break stuff down. and. Lichens can grow on rocks and break them down, for goodness sake. No, don't even mention trees. I mean, you know, it's like that. So, are, are fungi plants? Here's some things about plants. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're making their own food to an extent, although they still need help. Uh, they store their energy in starches. Their membranes contain cellulose. Are fungi animals? No. So animals have to ingest and digest their food. Their energy is stored in glycogen, and their membranes contain cholesterol. About 30% of human DNA contains some of the same DNA as fungi. We're much more closely related to fungi. Animals in general are, but humans are, than fungi are related to plants. So here's some things about fungi. They don't make their own food. They have to digest it. They use that enzymes. As the hyphae grow out, 
they release the enzymes ahead of themselves. It, it, it essentially liquefies whatever's there that they're decomposing, and then they absorb that liquid to weed out what they want from it. Um, so they digest their food, uh, their energy stored in glycogen as it is in animals. Their cell walls contain chitin. What do we know about chitin? Animals. Insects. Okay. Fingernails. Fingernails. What about it? What about it? It's hard. So if these cell walls contain chitin and we eat the mushrooms, they're going to pass right through our gut. They're full of nutrition if we do one thing. Have to heat them. They have to be heated to break down those chitin walls and make them digestible. You can eat raw mushrooms and they taste great, but you're not getting nutrition from them. So cook them. Their membranes contain ergesterol. Er which is a steroid alcohol that converts to vitamin D under UV light. What is the main source of UV light? So if you really want to boost the vitamin D in the mushrooms you're going to eat, set them out in the sun for a few hours to a day and let them soak up the sun. It, it multiplies the vitamin D a hundredfold. And then when you eat it, even cooking it doesn't affect that vitamin D content. I mean, they're amazing things. So, trying to find this button again. Here's the problem. We're humans who like to just use stuff. We think nature exists to give us these goods and these services and we don't really put a dollar value on it, especially in this country, but worldwide, really. We're all about the economy of it. If we don't know the value of it, then if we're negatively impacting its ability to stay in existence, we're not going to notice the signals that it's giving us that there's a problem. The environment needs us to do less to it, not more to it. But we're not going to take those actions unless we can put a dollar value on those services. I mean, we're, that's where we are, really. Quite simply, that's where we are. Um, in Chile, as part of their constitution, they have what's called a national environmental law. If you want a permit to develop in Chile, you have to have an assessment done to show the impact that you're going to make on flora and fauna. Well, these past few decades, the technology has told us more and more and more about how important fungi are to the environment. And so a grassroots group got together in Chile and they lobbied until in 2010, they got that law changed. So now if you want a permit to develop, you have to have an assessment done to determine your impact on flora, fauna, and fungi. That's where we should be if we want fungi to survive, the environment to thrive, and for things to go well for us. E.O. Wilson said the 21st century is destined to be known as the century of the environment. Well, we better get busy because we're 20 years in and I'm not seeing it. <laughs> we could end up like a line from the song of those other sages, the rock group Seether. Their line says, I am prepared now that everything's going to be fine. One day too late. Mm -hmm. And that's where we could end up. So what I want you to tell me is, you native plant people, <laughs> how do 
plants affect their soil environment for the next generation of plants? They don't de-aerate the soil with their roots. Okay. They alter the soil chemistry. They alter the soil chemistry. Yes, they do. How how might that happen? How might that look? They also have relationship with the bacteria that also open up and release nutrients. In the soil. So. They die. And they die. Yeah. So, all of those things we're talking about. Um, it, it does involve fungi to a great extent to assist with that process. So tell me something you could do right in your own personal residential landscape to not only help your plants, but to stimulate more fungal growth. Leave your leaves alone. So you could, so you could not remove the dead leaves. No Mulch, mow them, and rake them up around the trees. What else could you do? No tilling. You could not till. No not don't use chemical fertilizer. You make your plants and your grass lazy when you put on too much water, and those excess chemical fertilizers. The roots have no need to grow deep, get healthy find the fungi, find the nutrients, they're all gonna stay shallow rooted. They're all gonna just wait for you to give them something else to eat. You know, put, yeah, give me some more of that nitrogen phosphorus stuff that you put down here sometimes. That way I don't have to grow. So, I'm asking you to, uh, my battery is running low. Um, <laughs> in more ways than one. <laughs> So I'm asking you to consider the fungi, their role, how important they are, and when you're working in your garden, do your best to take care of them while you take care of your plants. So, um, my battery's running low, it won't change. Anyway. Is, is it off? I don't know, I don't know. How much more do you, there you go. I just, oh, I was only gonna give you my contact information and Thanks to Pauline, um, I made a typo. When I typed my email address, it's earthlink.net. <laughs> Thank you.